Welcome everyone. Today we have a very special guest. Myself and Michael Zuber are going to be interviewing someone uh, that is very well known. He was the chief economist at Morgan Stanley. He was the chairman of their Asia Investment Division. He is a Yale University professor and without a doubt he is one of the leading experts when it comes to the U.S. and China uh, economic policy. His name is Stephen Roach and today we're going to spend about 30 to 40 minutes with him talking about all sorts of things related to the economy. Um, and picking his brain for ideas and you know just concepts. So join us, and before we get started, make, make sure to subscribe, and uh, you'll get all the off-market deals and reports that I give to all my members. So let's get started. All right, everyone, welcome. Today we have a special guest, and by special, that's not that's an understatement. Uh, Mr. Stephen Roach from Yale University, uh, in his past chief economist for Morgan Stanley. He's written a book called Unbalanced, which I'm uh, about halfway through, and it's just a fantastic read. Uh, so today we'll be talking about two main things, uh, the China and U.S. relationship, and then inflation or the risk to the U.S. dollar. So with that said, hats off to you, Mr. Roach, and uh, would you mind giving us maybe a quick one, two minute spiel of your background and journey? Well, for the bulk of my career, I was the chief economist at Morgan Stanley and um, uh, where I worked for 30 years. Um, toward the end of my Wall Street career, uh, after having developed a real interest in uh, Asia in general and China in particular, uh, the firm shipped me out to uh, Hong Kong where I be headed up their Asia business as the chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. Uh, during that five-year period, roughly from 2007 to 2012, I spent the bulk of my time uh, in China, even though I lived in uh, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, finally decided to um, move back into academia, where I started out um, uh, decades ago, and uh, have been teaching at Yale ever since, teaching... Um, <clears throat> very popular course called The Next China, uh, which draws heavily on my uh, book, Unbalanced, the Codependency of America and China. Uh, also teach a um, seminar on uh, the lessons of Japan, and I'm eagerly looking forward to the start of school remotely uh, in a few days at Yale again. Awesome. Yeah, you know, in, in, in your book, um, one of the key, um, I guess, you know, uh, concepts that you, you talk about in detail is called this uh, false prosperity. And I think, you know, when it relates to how the U.S. economy is built in terms of a consumption economy, it's, it's really pertinent to a lot of investors that we talk to to think about how that may play out in their, in their strategies and overall, you know, ways of buying assets and just how they go about their own spending and consumption. So would you mind kind of explaining what false prosperity means to you and uh, I guess maybe the pros and cons at a high level to the U.S. economy. Well, yeah, that's an important point, uh, in, at least in my point of view. Uh, everybody wants uh, growth uh, and developing economies, of course, want it more than others because they want to develop and become uh, rich. And the notion of false prosperity is that um, a lot of politicians, sometimes um, politicians who co-opt policymakers, will try to squeeze too much juice out of the lemon. They'll, they'll push economies too far, well beyond what is sustainable based on uh, the fundamentals of uh, job growth and income generation, and they'll take risk. Uh, and sometimes that risk works out and sometimes it doesn't. In the case of the US, um, we, <clears throat> we pushed much too hard beginning in the late 1990s uh, to squeeze economic growth out of asset bubbles. First, the uh, equities, you remember dot-com, uh, then property, and then um, uh, credit bubbles. And <clears throat> that works until it doesn't. And what we know about financial bubbles is, um, you know, eventually they burst. And those who ended up borrowing uh, too much on the basis of um, uh, uh, collateral that had formed a bubble uh, get sort of left holding the bag. Uh, and they, they have to pull back very sharply. We've seen that repeatedly uh, in our bubble-induced recessions, uh, again, of the early 2000s, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, during the uh, global financial crisis. And who knows, possibly again right now as um, uh, equity markets soar 
uh, in a very weak uh, U.S. and global environment. So false prosperity just means going too far. And, you know, the U.S. is not alone. I mean, you know, we had bubbles uh, around the developed world. Japan was, of course, first with its bubbles in the late 1980s. Uh, China's had periodic property and equity bubbles. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, th these are calculated risks, sometimes not calculated, that policymakers, politicians take, and uh, that sort of drags, uh, uh, you know, the investors in the private economy down that same, sometimes precarious and dangerous road. Yep. And that, it sounds like as if the, the politicians and the Fed, to some extent, um, push the, 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 you know, the incentives to spend, the incentives um, based around this false prosperity, uh, which relate to more consumption and more consumption as a percentage of GDP. And I think from what I've seen, and as you detail in your book, the percentage of consumption based GDP relative to overall GDP has increased over time. And I, I guess I want to know, I mean, at, at some point that's, that's not sustainable and we may already be past that point. So obviously we have to start thinking about how we can get people to invest more, save more, uh, produce in different ways. I mean, just generally speaking from a risk standpoint, where do you think we are in term, when it comes to the consumption-based economy versus everything else? Well, the U.S., you know, we, I, I write about the U.S. Uh, in my book. I, I call uh, the American um, style of economic growth uh, as uh, following the model of the ultimate consumer. Mm. Uh, we've pushed the envelope in terms of the consumption share of GDP, as you indicated, uh, much further than uh, anyone else. Uh, and um, the, the asset bubbles that have formed repeatedly in the U.S. since the late uh, 1990s has been an important part of that culture of, of excess consumption. Uh, we have come to believe, and this has been aided and abetted by uh, the uh, deliberate strategies of the Federal Reserve, starting with um, the maestro himself, Alan Greenspan, that uh, asset appreciation uh, and the bubbles they form is the functional equivalent uh, of a, a permanent increase in saving. And yet time and again, hmm. those asset bubbles burst and the, the saving that we thought uh, was going to be enduring evaporates before our eyes. And so consumers get into these periodic balance sheet recessions. They have to restore yep. um, uh, their um, uh, uh, income-based saving to, to make them whole. And that leads to very sharp uh, adjustments in uh, saving behavior, uh, consumption behavior, and ultimately recessions. Uh, how far are we away from uh, uh, you know, changing the model? <laughs> not, not too far at all. I mean, you know, we, we think this is the, the way to go, and, uh, and we do so with great peril, in my opinion. Yep. Yes. Let me ask one question, and then Zuber, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Um, mm -hmm. So again, in your book, this is all really possible because China is dependent upon our, you know, consumption demand, right? They have cheap ways to produce right now. Um, but at, as you mentioned in your book, at some point, estimated around 2040, 2050, their per capita income will be near what the U.S. is, right? And so at some point, they're not going to be the main producers of goods at a cheap manner. Now, that might go to Vietnam, might go to Philippines, who knows? But the U.S. consumption model is only sustainable so long as we can acquire cheap goods. So that's a big risk as China develops in their economy and the middle class becomes upper class and so forth. We are going to have to figure out a way to change the model or adapt to other avenues. Um, so I guess, you know, just, just a few, what are some comments on that in terms of, you know, how sustainable is it really? I mean, it's as it relates to China. Well, um, you know, the U.S., as I, I call the ultimate consumer, I call China the ultimate producer. Uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, it, uh, China for the last 10 or 12 years has been focused on changing its model, rebalancing its economic structure, moving away from exports and investment toward a, a model uh, that is driven increasingly by internal private consumption uh, to promote the emergence of, you know, what is clearly going to be the largest middle class the world has ever seen and the most important 
source of aggregate consumer demand in the world uh, uh, in the, uh, the, the 21st century. And so this dynamic between uh, America as the consumer and China as the producer, it worked really well for a long time, but it's changing. Uh, and this is the principal theme of my book, Unbalanced, because the codependency between our two countries was never sustainable. It was just a temporary uh, state of affairs. And in a codependent human relationship, which is where I took the, uh, the broad structure of the book from, when one partner changes the rules of engagement, the other one gets ticked off, feels mm -hmm. left behind and scorned and gets into a sort of a blame game that's been manifested in the form of a trade war that we're living through right now. So it may seem like a stretch, and I was really criticized for my psychoanalysis <laughs> of two economies when I wrote the book. Well, guess what? You know, it's playing out uh, uh, in spades right now yeah. as the psychodrama becomes an economic drama, courtesy of our psychologically impaired uh, president, Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah. W one of the things I'd love to ask you about, uh, I think you called, I think it was in the middle of July, I saw you on CNBC talking about the risk of a double dip recession. And one of the things that I follow is the consumer. And we clearly have a disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. I don't think that's talking out of school. But the question I had for you is, is you know, when you start looking at this double dip recession, do you have some early indicators that you think we should be watching? To, is it, you know, flash data from companies like Walmart or where do you think it starts? Because I, you know, it's probably already happening, but where do we kind of get validation that this double dip recession is, is a true risk? And, and where do we see that crumbling first, do you think? Well, a few things. Uh, it's a great topic. Um, and I actually have an article coming out about that in the next few days. And ah. I, I don't know when you're, podcast comes out, but you can link to this article that will be out on Project Syndicate in the next few days. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the double dip is, is, it happens more often than not. What's a mm -hmm. double dip? You know, it, I, I use the GDP, um, quarterly GDP to measure. It's an economy that has entered a recession, appears to come out with positive growth as we're having, going to have, you know, in the third quarter of this year. It's an yeah. arithmetic certainty. Yeah, exactly. But then it goes back into negative territory. Yeah. By the way, it's happened. If you look at, you know, the history of post-World War II recessions, it's happened in eight of the 11 recessions. They've been double dips. Oh. Uh, and two of those eight have been triple dips. Really? When the economy comes up, goes down again, comes up and goes down again. Why does it happen? Yeah. It happens for two reasons. Um, the economy remains vulnerable uh, uh, because it's been hit hard by the initial shock. Uh, and secondly, uh, the aftershocks just continue to play out. So this mm -hmm. combination of vulnerability and the likelihood of aftershocks is the place to look. And so uh, look at that framework vis-a-vis -vis where we are uh, today. We've just been hit by the worst shock in our history. A 33% annualized drop in real GDP in the second quarter of this year breaks anything close to you know, prior records. The previous uh, worst case quarter was, uh, you know, minus 10 uh, in, the, in the late 1950. So, you know, we have been clobbered. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the aftershocks, um, uh, I think, are uh, a, a distinct possibility. Our, our COVID infection rate is running about 45,000 uh, new cases a day. That's double mm -hmm. what it was uh, a few months ago. The University of Washington says, you know, we're going to have a thousand deaths a day between now and the end of the year. Wow. Uh, you know, this is a very real uh, uh, ongoing risk uh, to Americans who are fearful uh, of engaging in face to face services activity like That's eating in restaurants, shopping in stores, travel, and leisure. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a compelling case. Watch the quarterly GDP. The, set, the third quarter is going to be a strong uh, rebound, but I'm worried about the fourth quarter of this year, the first quarter uh, of next year. I think the odds of a double dip based on history are very, very high. And I think mm -hmm. this time is not going to be any different. Yeah. And then the other question I wanted to make sure I got your purview on is, again, as a real estate guy, one of the things that is 
at least single family homes, you know, the, the, the vast market of the U.S. Is, is having a good time, right? Big cities, New York, San Francisco, arguably struggling both with rent and value. But when you look at the urban flight, the rush to the suburbs, and the fact that real estate generally is 10% of GDP, do you, is it, can it punch up above its weight class? Or do you think this is just a caffeine or a sugar high because of low rates and some pent up millennials who've been living in apartments too long that are now owning and this too will pass in the double dip recession? Or you have any thoughts about the general single Look, family? Look, you guys market? are the experts. Um, you know, I'm just, uh, <laughs> you know, somebody who's, you know, bought and sold homes for a long period. Um, and, um, you know, I, I do see what's going on is that, you know, there's a uh, flight from urban centers. I love cities. My favorite city in the world is New York. And mm. you know, it looks cataclysmic there right now. Rental rates, uh, yeah. rental vacancy rates are double their are pre-COVID norms. And, yeah. uh, you know, my, my friends are fleeing the city and going to their second homes. And I don't know if they'll ever go back. And, uh, you know, I worry about uh, the future of uh, cities. Uh, I think ultimately, though, real estate, um, you know, has, has been a great investment for a, a long, long period of time. But uh, the sort of the way the markets are being disrupted right now mm -hmm. uh, and the persistence of unusually high unemployment and mm -hmm. uh, incomes remaining under pressure, those are powerful headwinds, even uh, in an era of low interest rates uh, and um, uh, the, the, the demand for shelter. So I think it's going to be a long time before the real estate business truly establishes a new equilibrium, settles mm -hmm. out. Uh, I, I see what's going on to suburban values right now, but uh, is that sustainable? Those are open questions. Yeah, I think, okay. you know, I, you know, I think Zuber, as you know, a, a big component of this is really just supply and demand, right? We have a massive... Well, I guess pre-COVID, we had a 2.5 million unit shortage and mm -hmm. builders pulled back like 40% on their building. So, mm -hmm. and they were already building at a, at a level that was below what they needed, right? So, mm -hmm. I, I, until that somehow figures itself out, I don't, I don't really know. Um, but that's a good point that uh, you bring up, Stephen, about the um, sort of the, you know, the, the income, uh, if you will. And when you think about the income, wage growth hasn't been, you know, uh, a rocket ship, but the the risk to wages could be inflation or the risk in the the devaluing of the dollar, right? Um, so I'd be curious to get your thoughts. What are some preliminary signs that the dollar has some risk right now? I just saw Ray Dalio pick up a big gold position. Buffett just uh, had a five hundred and sixty million dollar position in Barrick Gold. Gold's at a an all time high. Silver's climbing. I mean, what what are you seeing uh, as some risk to the dollar? Well, you know, I just go back to my um, humble task as an economist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio. Uh, and, um, you know, I'll let them speak for themselves in terms of the positions that they take in markets. But, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the earlier point we discussed, saving. I'm a big believer that no economy can prosper over the long haul. Uh, without saving. And as I look at the U.S., we've mm. tried to do it. And we've tried to substitute asset-based savings for income-based savings. Mm. Uh, but ultimately, I worry about that as a sustainable uh, trajectory for the United States or for any economy. Pre-COVID, our domestic savings rate, um, which is the sum total of the saving by businesses, households, and the government sector. And then I had take out the, the portion of that that goes to um, the depreciation of uh, uh, the sort of obsolete or worn out uh, capital. So I look at what I call the net national savings rate. The government publishes this number every quarter. In the first quarter of 2020, pre-COVID, it was 2.9% of national income, mm -hmm. which is amazingly low. Uh, our historical net national or net domestic savings rate was 7% in the 45 years from 1960 to 2005. Hmm. The net savings rate today is going sharply into negative territory as massive budget, uh, government budget deficits far offset the temporary surge of, of household saving 
that was brought about, um, you know, by these um, uh, $1,200 checks uh, and the extended unemployment benefits, which have now, uh, of course, expired due to the uh, uh, irresponsible um, uh, lack of uh, negotiations on, uh, you know, another deal by the, the U.S. Congress. As the net domestic savings rate goes sharply into negative territory, our balance of payments deficit is going to blow up. Mm. Uh, countries that don't save and want to grow import surplus capital from abroad, and they run massive balance of payments deficits to attract the capital. When countries have, even the United States, uh, have big balance of payments deficits, there's, there's two powerful adjustment mechanisms that take place to attract the foreign capital, uh, either a cheaper dollar or higher interest rates. The Fed has made a conscious decision to keep interest rates low. So the adjustment mechanism will show up through the, the currency. And that's why I've got this view that the dollar is in the early stages of a sharp decline. I see the dollar index dropping 35% in real terms over the next couple of years. And we've, we've seen about 10 points of that, but we have a lot more uh, hmm. uh, to go. So I'm very focused on the dollar as the adjustment mechanism in this period of um, uh, sharp reductions uh, in net domestic savings. Stephen, that was the one question I wanted to follow up on the dollar. I saw your call for 35% uh, here recently. Um, Let's, let's try to simplify this for the average American, right, who A, is not an economist, B, doesn't have an advanced degree, doesn't have the worlds of experience that, that, that you have. Where, where are they going to see it? Where does a 35% drop in the purchasing power of the dollar affect the average American? Well, that's a, f a fair question. So, uh, currency um, uh, relations are, you know, if, if you don't travel and if you don't have a real um, desire to look at um, uh, buying foreign goods or domestic goods, you know, why worry about it? You worry about it for a couple of things, reasons. One, uh, currencies are relative prices. They compare mm -hmm. our country vis-a-vis -vis other countries. The dollar has been strong uh, since um, uh, 2011, as the world has really given us a vote of confidence vis-a-vis mm. -vis, uh, other nations. But in the same sense they've given us that vote of confidence, we have now led the, uh, the world on uh, the debate towards uh, deglobalization, decoupling, trade mm. protectionism. Uh, we've attacked, uh, at least our administration, has attacked um, the world's leading institutions, uh, like uh, global institutions, like uh, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization. We've pulled out of the Paris Agreement on uh, climate change, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, we have failed miserably uh, in dealing with uh, the coronavirus vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Uh, our infection rate, uh, it's improved a little bit in the last few weeks, but it's still triple that of the European Union, whose population uh, is 35% larger uh, than ours. Mm. And of course, we have a systemic uh, problem with uh, uh, racism that, in, that has been glaringly apparent in the aftermath of the appalling public murder of um, uh, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. So the world is looking at us once the uh, unquestioned leader. Uh, of the uh, uh, the free world, I think with a much more jaundiced eye, and I think the average American is is deeply concerned about that and will likely uh, get uh, more concerned going forward. Uh, and as the dollar comes under pressure, uh, you know, the, I think the average American citizen uh, will uh, feel those concerns very deeply and mm -hmm. will look to other uh, segments of uh, the world economy and foreign exchange markets for more stable uh, and uh, possibly uh, a more uh, uh, and greater value in their currencies. Yeah, I, and I think more, you know, most closely to home, right? Again, a lot of those goods come from China, 
which are bought by U.S. dollars, right? So those prices should go up across the Walmarts, or Targets of the world, Amazon. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what portion of it is, but I believe a lot of people on Amazon who sell goods are buying them from Chinese manufacturers. Well, they've the been doing shop. that for a long time. And, right. um, you know, of course, the Trump administration has launched uh, a full-blown trade war against anything uh, that, that comes from China or reflects components from China or that, you know, even, um, you know, uh, is, is available on, you know, these Chinese apps mm. uh, like the teenage app TikTok or, yeah. or, or social media WeChat. There's no logic to that. It just reflects the fact that uh, the, the president is in very bad shape uh, politi- politically uh, and in large part, that is an outgrowth of his malfeasance in dealing with the coronavirus. And the Republican strategists have advised him, uh, and he's taken the bait completely, uh, to uh, attack China to deflect attention away from his uh, malfeasance in addressing uh, COVID-19. Uh, this has been leaked out in strategy documents that uh, the Republican uh, advisors have um, been very transparent in um, uh, uh, putting out in the last few months. And uh, the president and his minions, you know, the, I called them in a piece I wrote a few weeks ago, the gang of America's gang of four. Yeah. Uh, and National uh, uh, Security uh, Director uh, O'Brien, uh, FBI Director uh, Chris Wray, um, the uh, Secretary of, um, of, of State, uh, uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, and um, uh, there's one more, his name I can't remember, um, uh, that rounds out the Gang of Four. They, they have led the, 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 the charge in the most vitriolic uh, assault uh, on uh, a, uh, a nation like China that we, have, we haven't seen really since the McCarthyism of the early 1950s. It's pretty appalling, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and it, and it seems, uh, on the, at least on the surface, that there's a reta- retaliation measure going on in China to almost, almost compete with this combative nature that we're seeing in the U.S. Well, well that's what happens when uh, codependency becomes yep. unhinged in humans. You know, the, the, the two partners that have sort of coexisted in this sort of... Um, marriage of convenience start to attack each other. And that becomes um, uh, a, a serious problem. Yep. Awesome. Well, hey, I, I appreciate your time. Um, I think we know where you stand on your political divide. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I try to be apolitical uh, in doing yeah. my work because I think that yeah. uh, injects, uh, you know, sometimes a contentious uh, note of, um, a bias and people start to question your objectivity uh, as an economic analyst. But there are times where I make exceptions because mm-hmm. the politics really do have an important impact yep. on the, the, the economic framework. And this is one of those times. Yeah. The, the one question I wanted to ask if we had time, Stephen, is actually I'm an econ grad from Santa Clara University way back in 1995. And you're about to go back and train some students at Yale here in a few days. Has anything changed in 25 years? Are you teaching anything new to the undergrads in economics? Yeah, uh, a lot. Lots changed. I mean, um, you know, we're in the midst of a trade war. Where does a trade war come from? What's it mean? Uh, okay. How do we resolve it? Uh, and, and, you know, we, we, I think we've really had to sort of bring this uh, uh, dynamic uh, uh, into the uh, macroeconomic framework in ways that none of us uh, ever in, envisioned. You know, when I studied economics as a grad student, you know, believe it or not, uh, it tells you how old I am, in the late 60s and early 70s, I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time focusing on uh, the, um, uh, the likelihood of a full-blown uh, trade war. We harbored, the, I think, the false presumption that, you know, we learned the lessons of history, that, you know, we did this once, uh, in the 1930s, right. that was before my time, uh, <laughs> and it ended very, very uh, poorly. Yeah. We, the whole world was dragged into a trade war. But this is a 
political environment that really has no clear appreciation uh, of these painful lessons of history. Uh, and, uh, you know, this you know, notion that uh, you know, we have a, a political um, uh, dynamic that has mastered the art of the deal that can uh, uh, throw around uh, tariffs and other forms of trade protectionism uh, with impunity is really reckless. pretty appalling and reckless. And, and yet we're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I think we now have to look at the consequences of what we're doing and who we elected. Yep. Agreed. There you go. So one more time, uh, you have an article coming out in a few days. Uh, we'll post this on the same day so that everyone kind of, it all coincides. But um, again, I'll, for everyone out there, I'll post the links to the book uh, that I've been reading. It's fantastic. And um, Zuber, any last comments? No, I just want to thank Stephen for his time. Uh, I wish your daughter well in the cross-country journey. And I, I, wish, uh, I wish Yale much success in all the universities and getting students back in class. Uh, we, we need that. We need to take care of them. I couldn't imagine going to university and have to do it remote. But, uh, that's that's got to be tough. It's pretty challenging. Uh, and yet, you know, education is our future. And we've got to figure out how to totally agree. Uh, keep investing in that future and these young kids that... Uh, are going to school, um, you know, they, they have a huge challenge in trying to realize that dream. And we have a big challenge trying to teach them. Yes, sir. Thank you for all you do. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. When I saw it down.